welcome to the ACSM Early Career Day. Thanks for coming. We really appreciate you guys coming to this event. This is our third year um, offering this pre-conference. And our purpose is really to offer you guys additional opportunities for networking with some of the experts in the field and also getting some career development advice from the people who've made it. Um, and so we hope you've come ready to ask a lot of questions because our sessions are going to be very interactive and really rely on your questions and um, so that you guys can get the information that you need. My name is Lene Mudd. Um, I am part of the planning committee for this session uh, along with Matt Kostick and Mark Rolch. And we're really excited about our panels of speakers that we have for you guys coming up. We're going to start today with this opening session. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how to get the most out of your annual ACSM meeting experience, especially for those of you that this might be your first time at the ACSM meeting. It can be really overwhelming. And so I wanted to give you some of my tips for getting the most out of this. And then we're going to have a keynote speaker uh, that's going to give some great career advice. And then we're going to break out into breakout sessions. And there's going to be uh, different tracks with different emphases. And so I'll explain those after our keynote speaker is done. And then stick around for the very end. We have a social with free snacks. Um, so you'll want to stick around for that where you can do some more networking. So first of all, just getting the most out of the annual meeting. So these are the topics that I want to cover. What is the purpose of coming to the ACSM annual meeting? Well, hopefully, by the end of this week, you'll have learned something. Um, and hopefully, you'll meet a lot of new people and think of new ideas for your own um, career and for your own research and obviously have a lot of fun. So to maximize the learning uh, from the conference, here are a few tips. First of all, there's a lot of sessions going on. So you want to plan your sessions in advance. And it's easy to do too much at ACSM because there's so much offered. Um, so I really encourage you to choose like three to five things that you really want to see each day. But be sure to give yourself breaks in between so that your brain just doesn't shut down. List questions that you want answers to. And try to find sessions that will answer those questions. And use these sessions to not only look within your target area, but broaden your interest. Because you never know where uh, a session might take you. And it might drastically change where you want to go in your future. You might decide, hey, you know what? Man, that school has some really cool research going. I want to apply there for a PhD. Um, so that can really change where you go. And write down the ideas you get during a session, because I can't tell you how many conferences I've been to where I get really energized and jazzed about a new idea, and then I completely forget it by the time I'm on my flight home because I forgot to write it down. It's really important here to interact with presenters and other people attending the sessions that you're in. Um, I know as students, we're often intimidated by the speakers themselves. But you should realize that the speakers are really excited to share their information and their ideas. They've spent a lot of time preparing for these sessions, and they really want to interact with people about their research findings. And so don't be shy to ask your questions. There's not a stupid question. Um, don't be shy to introduce yourself, even if you don't have a question. Even just hearing, hey, I really found that talk interesting. Um, is, is a good opener to start talking with and networking with a presenter. And if one speaker has information you're really interested in, you can always ask to talk later because sometimes it gets a little swamped at the end of a session. But remember, it's on you to follow up with them if that's the case. So one of the questions I got asked a lot when I was chair of the Student Affairs Committee here at ACSM is, how do I network? What is networking? Well, first of all, you have to know where to network. And the answer to that is really everywhere. Um, so there are a lot of places to meet people at ACSM. One of my biggest tips is if you go to a session, make sure you sit down by somebody you don't know and introduce yourself to them. Because obviously, they're interested in the same stuff that you are. So that's a good contact to make. So here are my top five networking tips. 
of how to engage somebody else um, when you're trying to meet people. So first of all, just being confident in yourself and being friendly uh, will break the ice. Know what you want to say. Have a little bit of an elevator introduction about who you are, your name, where you're from, where you're at in your schooling, and what you're interested in. Know who you want to meet as well. So there might be people here that you've read a research paper and you really want to meet them. And so, you know, be proactive about that. Find out when they're speaking, go to their session, and introduce yourself to them. But also be open to random networking as well. Be ready to exchange contact information. If you don't have a business card, that's okay. As students, a lot of, a lot of you guys won't. Um, but you can ask for their business card. Say, so, you know, I've really been wanting to meet you. I would love to ask you some more questions. Can I get your business card or can I get your email? And then again, it's on you to follow up with an email uh, within the next couple days. So that's the last point, follow up and quickly um, before they forget who you are because we're meeting a lot of people at this meeting and so the sooner you can follow up with somebody and say, hey, I am the person in the lime green shirt that met you after your session on Tuesday. Um, that helps them jog their memory and say, oh yeah, I remember and you asked me this question. So a few opportunities I wanted to make sure all the students in this room were aware of. Um, first of all, it's great that you're here, um, but we have even more opportunities for career development. The student colloquium will be tomorrow night at 5.30. Show of hands, anybody planning on going? Be proud. It's a good, it's a good event. I highly recommend it. Um, we also have the student Jeopardy Bowl. Anybody going to that? Yeah, go cheer on your teams, uh, see who wins. Um, there's going to be sessions at the student lounge, so just go by the student help desk to find out about those. And finally, there's a meet the experts lunch on Friday. And since you guys are already here, you have a leg up, go to the student help desk and get your ticket because that sells out fast. It's an opportunity to sit and have lunch with an expert in the field and get more one-on-one -on -one networking. So those are my main tips. Um, the last thing I wanted to leave you with is uh, the opportunity to get your research funded by ACSM. Um, so just keep this in mind. I know January 16th sounds like a long ways off, but it's not when you're talking about writing up a grant. Um, so if you want to get your research funded, talk with your advisors um, and go to uh, acsm.org to find out more information on these awards. So, with that, I would like to welcome up our keynote speaker. Dr. Barry Franklin. So Dr. Barry Franklin is a director of the Cardiac Rehabilitation Program and Exercise Laboratories at William Beaumont Hospital in Royal Oak, Michigan. He's also a professor of physiology at Wayne State University School of Medicine. Um, he has been a past president of the American College of Sports Medicine, and he has a real heart for students in career development and is really good at giving a lot of great career development advice. And so I'd like to welcome him to the stage, and please join me in welcoming him. Good afternoon. When Mark called and asked, would I be willing to do this, the answer was unequivocally yes. People sometimes wonder why is he so interested in giving a presentation. Uh, I'm not interested in giving another presentation, but this audience has particular relevance to me. At the age of 18, I just turned 66. At the age of 18, I was an undergraduate student at Kent State University. I had heard a very famous cardiologist, Herman Hellerstein, Dr. Herman Hellerstein, lecture several times. I was enthralled by his persona, the kinds of work he did, and one day out of the blue, I drove two and a half hours from Kent State to Case Western Reserve University and walked into his office and met his secretary. Looked like the Wicked Witch of the West. I looked at her, 
She looked like she was some 80 years old, very mean, very ugly. And I said, is Dr. Hellerstein around? And she said, who are you? I said, I'm Barry Franklin. I'm an undergraduate student. I've read a lot of the doctor's papers. I've heard him lecture, and I uh, just drove two and a half hours to get here. I'd love to meet with him. I realize he may have other appointments. I can stick around. She looked at me, and she said something like, young man, you can't see the great and powerful Wizard of Oz without an appointment. <laughs> I started walking back down the hall, dejected, embarrassed, I was heading back to Kent State, and I see Dr. Hellerstein, a white lab coat, gray hair, and I decided, look, I come all this way, I'm going to at least shake his hand and tell him I admire his work. He said to me, um, you just drove two and a half hours to meet with me? And I said, yeah, but Mrs. Husselman, your secretary said you got a lot of, lot of uh, patients all day. He said, come on in the office. This man sat with me for two and a half hours. We looked at slides, we looked at EKGs. I walked out, and by the way, she was pissed. <laughs> she was pissed to no end and would walk back and forth and say, Dr. Hellerstein, you got patients to see. He said, I'm just going to spend a few more minutes with these, this young man. This is about career importance. I walked out of there knowing what I wanted to do, that is work in cardiology, and I also vowed if I ever really become successful, like if I get a master's degree or something like that, <laughs> I'm going to spend time with students. And as a result, for our own student internship program and everything else, I spend lots of time with students because I remember not the few minutes, but the two hours that man gave me that day changed my life, changed my career. And hell, if I can't spend 30 minutes or 45 minutes giving you some advice, shame on me. It's as simple as that. My task is a formidable one, but I must tell you I'm a superstitious individual. So I got the morning paper this morning here, and it said, today will be a banner day for you. You give a great presentation before a relatively young, attractive, intelligent audience destined for success, deafening pa uh, applause is likely. <laughs> and needless to say, I felt a hell of a lot better coming here today. I'm going to cover four things for you, and then they're going to get into more specifics. But I got to tell you, I wish I knew this, what I'm going to tell you at the age of 18, 20, 22. I'm going to talk about the impact of mentors, changing your focus from looking for rewards to focusing on contributions, the importance of association involvement, and finally, professional success strategies, leadership skills, and I'll do this whole thing in about 42 minutes. That's me. Woo! <laughs> That's me, 1966. And I got to tell you, I blinked, and nearly 50 years have gone by. And one day, you're going to blink, if you're lucky, and 40, 50 years will go by. And you say, where did my life go? What did I do? Did I make the most of it? My journey involved the following. Positions at Millard Fillmore Hospital. Ultimately, I went to Case Western Reserve and, believe it or not, worked with the famous Herman Hellerstein. Sinai Hospital, Detroit, William Beaumont Hospital. I was president of AACVPR, ACSM in 2000. I chaired two major AHA groups, Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Metabolism, and the AHA Advocacy Committee, working primarily with physicians. My areas of interest are shown here since 1985. I've been at William Beaumont Hospital in Royal Oak, Michigan as Director of Preventive Cardiology and Cardiac Rehab. And we recently opened up a medical school where I serve as Professor of Internal Medicine. My hobby, however, is studying successful people and successful organizations. Why are they so good? Why is he successful and she may be not? I want to start by emphasizing to you it's critical at this stage of your career to find a mentor who you respect and admire. There's nothing wrong with two or three mentors. Occasionally somebody says, well, I could work in this person's lab or I can work in the world famous person's lab, but I'm going to make a dollar less an hour, so I think I'm gravitating to the other opportunity. And I'm thinking, oh, you could work with the world famous person and you're worried about a dollar difference an hour. Work with the best. Surround yourself 
with the best. I love this quote. What is mentorship? If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you're a leader or you're a mentor. That's me on the left. It's not a wig either. <laughs> Steve Lindbergh, this guy here by the name Bruno Balki, Dan McKernan. We were students six months at Penn State University in the early 70s. Carl Stadefalk, our advisor, said, I'm sending you guys to Aspen, Colorado. We said, wow, that's, we, we can handle that. You're going to work with Bruno Balki in the first exercise specialist workshop, and none of you three better come back to Penn State not passing that damn exam. We never got to downtown Aspen. We studied our butts off, and all three of us passed. It was the first ACSM exercise specialist workshop. Bruno Balky at altitude made everybody run a 15-minute Balky run the second day there. <laughs> then later on at Penn State University, I worked with the esteemed, preeminent Ellsworth, the late Ellsworth Buskirk, world-renowned scientist, who gave me the, suggested this project, looking at fitness in women. When I did my dissertation back in 76, lots of studies suggested that women were not as trainable as men. They didn't show the same magnitude of improvement in VO2 max and so on and so forth. And Buzzkirk said, that's because all those studies used so suboptimal training intensities. You push those women, we're going to get the same things. And we did. Buzzkirk was another mentor who had a profound impact on me. Buzzkirk left a note in my mailbox one day that says, see me herb, E.R. Buzzkirk. I was shaking in my boots. So I went to his office and he was sitting right there, world renowned scientist. I'd given him a copy of my doctoral dissertation and he laid into me. He said, I finished reading your dissertation, draft page 92. What do you mean when you state maximal oxygen consumption changed favorably in a positive manner over the course of the exercise program? I replied, it increased. <laughs> Buzz Kirk looked at me and he said, uh-huh. Well, then just say post-conditioning VO2 max increased significantly. Buzz Kirk was a man of few words, and I can tell you with lots of experience in scientific writing, few words are better. If you can say it in five words as opposed to 15, that's what they're looking for. And he was the mentor to show me where I had 12 words, I could say the same thing in six or seven. My path then crossed with two world-renowned scientists who you may recognize, the late Dr. Michael Pollack and Stephen Blair. Both had a profound impact in terms of mentorship on me. I watched these guys and was in awe. Pollock and I especially developed a great relationship. We traveled abroad. We took our wives. And when I think of Michael Pollock, I think of this quote. Candle is not diminished by giving another candle light. By helping you, my stature is not diminished one iota. Michael Pollack's candle has and will continue to light the candles of others through his teaching, writing, research, volunteer service, journal contributions, all the conferences Michael Pollack did, and through the patients and professionals that he touched over the years. I got to tell you, I was one of them, one of many. When you say what had an impact on your career, my good fortune was I hooked up with the late Michael Pollack and watched what he did and followed, tried to follow in his footsteps. It's not just men, but women. What you see, who you see, is probably one of the most preeminent nurses in the country today. Kathy Barra, Stanford University, multi-million dollar projects. We work together on lots of things. Kathy has become a dear friend and a mentor to me. Find the best get a chance to work with them. Topic number two, change your focus from rewards to contributions. I was fortunate enough two years ago to be invited to Thailand to give a series of medical lectures. 
and one of the most wealthy men in Thailand said to my wife and I, we're going to give you my summer home for two, three days. They'll take you around and so on and so forth. Clearly, this place was worth millions and millions. We walked around with our mouths open. This guy didn't know us from Adam. There were four other students or four other faculty, and he opened it up. But what got my attention is when I'm walking through this multi-million dollar palatial mansion, there's a big sign on the steps going up to the bedrooms. And that sign read, we become successful by helping other people to become successful. We become successful by helping others to become successful. When I look at these kinds of things, oftentimes young students, young faculty, when we talk about career, more often than not, I'm hearing stuff like, well, I want to make good salary, I want honors, I want to travel, and so on and so forth. They're focusing on the wrong end of the scale because your rewards equal your contributions. Service, helping others, inventing products, becoming a great employee where you are. Focus on the contributions and the money and the fame and the trips will come. Focus on the money, fame, and trips, they'll never come. You gotta make yourself, wherever you go, invaluable to the people you're working for. I love this quote, Zig Ziglar, the late Zig Ziglar, you can get anything you want in life if you help enough other people get what they want. Steve Jobs, Ray Kroc, Henry Ford, Walt Disney, don't be afraid to innovate. I'm a big fan of Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins says the same thing. The best way to ensure your success is to experience or to assist others in experiencing their own success. Topic number three, three out of the four, association involvement. I cannot tell you the profound impact that ACSM has had on my career. And I know I'm not alone. You talk to Steve Blair, you talk to Larry Durstein, you talk to so many people. They got involved, they joined, and they got active. Love this GPS for success, Mac Douglas. Dedicate your life to a cause greater than yourself and your life will become a glorious adventure. How do you do that? How do you dedicate your life to a bigger cause? The answer is get involved in association. I didn't just do ACSM. I did AACBPR and AHA and met different kinds of people from all over the world. As the MasterCard commercial says, it's priceless. When I was president of the ACSM, Jim Whitehead said to me, what do you want to write about? I said, I want to talk to young people about and try to give them some of the best advice I could give them. Here was a portion of that column. I said, relative to opportunities in the college, for the most part, you create your own luck. Complete a committee interest form. Support the annual meeting by submitting a high quality abstract. I'll send any of my people who are presenting at this meeting. I won't send anyone just because they want to go and learn. They've got to show me they're willing to go a little extra by doing an abstract, by getting involved in a presentation. Get involved at the regional chapter, I said. Support ACSM publications by submitting your best research to MSSE. When appropriate, apply for ACSM fellow status. Repeat the above reference strategies. Do them in a timely manner and to the best of your ability. The results I concluded in this column will be in direct proportion to your service and considerably greater than you ever imagined. I guarantee it. Why be a member of ACSM? You learn the latest advances in your field. You get a chance to interact with some of the top authorities in the world, job hunting, consulting interviews. 
publishing, writing, media, media opportunities. I'll get back to this one. That's why I put it in blue. You get to chan a chance to meet key thought leaders in related fields, biomechanics, and so on and so forth. Invited presentations, opportunities to present at regional and national meetings, research collaboration, leadership opportunities, and fi finally, as David Letterman would say, the number one, the people, friends, and esteemed colleagues you meet along the way. Let's go to these two, media opportunities and opportunities to present at national meetings. Why are they important? I vividly recall the American Heart Association. I was working on a big new physical activity initiative for them, and they said, we need a favor. Can you go to New York and spend a day with Jane Seymour, the actress? I said, I can do that. Would you mind being with Jane and the president of the a AHA and open up the New York stock market tomorrow morning? I said, I can do that. Stuff I never dreamed about happened. A year later, true story. AHA called me and said, there's an entertainer who just lost his father and he is now embracing heart health. And we want a person from the AHA to go and do some media interviews with him. Would you be willing to do it? I said, sure, who is it? His name, you may know him, his name is Donny Osmond. I said, I can do that. Spent a day with Donny Osmond, told my wife, I'm going to New York, spent a day with Donny Osmond. She said, get two tickets. <laughs> you ain't going there by yourself, pal. Donny Osmond, two weeks later, opened show with Marie at the Flamingo in Las Vegas and had two front row seats for my wife and I. These are things you'd never imagine you get through association involvement. Here's something else I tell students. Every time you give a presentation at ACSM, there's an addition that you're taking. You never know who's in the audience. Two quick stories. 20 years ago, I did a debate with Bob DeBusk. It was hot and heavy, talking about stress testing and so on and so forth. After the debate, a guy comes up who I'd never met before, said, uh, Dr. Franklin, I like your talk. Can you do that in my country? I said, where do you live? He said, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Can you come? We will pay all your expenses. We'll pay your wife's expenses. I said, I can come. He said, bring a, a swimsuit, not so big. <laughs> Here we wear dental floss. A similar event to this one, 10 years ago, I was talking about success strategies, and a lady comes up who I didn't know that well. I'd met her a couple times, Toby Tate, dean at the University of Chicago, Illinois. True story. Toby came up and she said, I like that talk. Would you be willing to do our commencement address? I said, how many people? She said, 3,000. I said, sure. How much time will I have? She said, 10 minutes. You can't, have, you can't have an hour, you have 10 minutes. I said, sure. I came home, told my wife, who's the business person, I'm doing the commencement address at the University of Chicago, Illinois. Her first question was, how much are you getting paid? So I never even asked. It's a, this is a big deal to do a commencement address. I never even asked. She said, you're an idiot. <laughs> you're going to go to Chicago, and you're not even going to get paid, and you're going to spend time? One month before the talk, the commencement address, Toby Tate calls, Dean Tate calls me, and she said, uh, you want to bring your wife on us? I said, sure. Put us up at a nice hotel. I got into the hotel room. There's a dozen roses for my wife. She took us out to a beautiful dinner. I gave the 10-minute commencement address. And we're flying back, and my wife said, well, this was nice, but um, I still say you're an idiot. And people take advantage of you. Three weeks later, so help me God, calling my wife. It's over the noon hour. I said, Linda, what's going on? She said, oh, I just got the mail. She said, there's something from the dean's office at the University of Illinois, Chicago. I said, why don't you open it up? It's probably a thank you note. All of a sudden, there's silence at the other end of the phone. I said, Linda, you still there? She said, oh, yeah, I'm still here. I said, what's wrong? 
She said, Dean Tate's my new best friend. <laughs> I said, why is that? She says, did you know there's a check in here for $2,500 for that commencement address? I said, I didn't have a clue. That's the point. Do things, do things well, don't worry about the money, and good things are going to happen to you. And here, volunteer leadership, in my opinion, is the ultimate training laboratory. If you can lead volunteers well who aren't getting compensated, you can lead anybody. So this is a great training ground. Get on committees, get in interest groups. This is a terrific training ground for future development. And finally, topic number four. And here I'll spend most of the, my time on this. Because these things that I'm going to tell you in all sincerity are priceless. First and foremost, find out what you love to do. Steve Jobs said it best. The only way to do great work is love what you do. If you haven't found it, keep looking. I was taken back by this quote years ago by the vice president of the Orlando Magic. He said, figure out what you love to do as young as you can, and then organize your life around figuring out how to make a living at it. In other words, figure out what you love to do and then get somebody else to pay you to do that for the rest of your life. That's a successful person. So you go to work every day loving what you do. I do that. I can't believe they pay me for doing stress testing, for teaching, for writing grants, for doing TV media interviews, and so on and so forth. Find out what you're fairly good at, find out what you're willing to work hard on, and go for it. Here's something else that I oftentimes hear. They didn't hire me because they didn't like me. The professor gave me a B because he didn't like my responses. My answer is this, really, the real winners in life take 100% responsibility for everything that happens to them. I'll say that again, they take 100% responsibility. For all of us, there's events, there's our responses, and there's outcomes. I do a lot of writing. Occasionally, I get an outcome is not, that, not what I'm looking for. Dear Dr. Franklin, thank you for your manuscript. We've decided to uh, decline it, not high, not high enough priority, or we want major revisions. I've got to change my response to get the ultimate outcome that I want. I showed this at a student colloquia at Kent State. And Claire Casino, Kent State University student, three weeks later sent me a little note. And then she said, Dr. Franklin, you know the 10 most powerful two-letter words and I didn't know. So I said, what are they? So I want to give her credit. If it is to be, it is up to me. If it is to be, it's up to me. How do you set yourself apart from the crowd? I get this from young professors. I get this from students all the time. I tell you, do two things. Number one, routinely do more than you're paid to do. And secondly, focus your efforts on becoming great where you are. I know lots of people who change every two years or three years to a different job looking for greener pastures. There are diamonds right below where you're at. You just have to mine those diamonds in every place. Let's focus on these success strategies. Point number one, attitude is everything. If I'm hiring you and you're coming from the University of South Carolina and I say, how is South Carolina? And you say, well, it's not that good. The administration isn't good and we don't have any equipment. I can tell you right now, the interview is over. I don't want you at my place. The right answer is South Carolina is fabulous. I've really enjoyed it, but they don't have tavers. They don't have the angioplasty, they don't have some of the stuff, so I think I could take my career a, f a step further, but I've had great training at the University of South Carolina. <laughs> During interviews, I oftentimes show people this and I ask them, read that for me. How do you guys read that? If you read it as opportunity is now here, I'm interested in you. If you read it, read it as opportunity is nowhere, I've lost interest in you. People see the same thing on a day-to-day -day basis. Somebody's positive, somebody's negative. I'm looking for the people who look for the positives. 
And thirdly, if you haven't read this book, read it, because it's very powerful. It's called The Secret. It was on the New York Times bestseller list for many, many uh, months. It basically says, what you're focusing on, you bring to fruition. It's the law of attraction. Secondly, establish and pursue goals. Harvard Medical School, Harvard University. Fascinating report came out years ago. They looked at, listen carefully, they looked at Harvard graduates. They followed them 10 years after they graduated. The ones who had no major goals other than to get a job, they made on average $100,000 a year. The ones who graduated with some specific goals, not well defined, made on average $300,000 a year. And the 3% who graduated with a list of things that they looked at on a day-to-day -day basis that they were going to achieve, written down goals, made on average a million dollars a year. Be goal-oriented, write them down, focus them, look at them. A to-do list, very, very important. And get involved to establish your goals in collaboration. Anybody know this guy? Who is he? Steven Spielberg. Pretty successful director. I heard him interviewed about a year ago on television, and the, the interviewer said, Mr. Spielberg, you're a genius. How do you do all these great movies? And I was really taken back by his response. You know what it was? I'm not a genius at all. Very simple. You want me to do your movie? You've got to hire two guys, Steven Spielberg and a friend of mine by the name of George Lucas because George makes me look good. George came up with the ET. George came up with stuff we did in Schindler's List and so on and so forth. Find people who have skills you don't have, partner with them, and share the glory. And finally, never stop learning. Don't stop at a bachelor's. Don't stop at a master's. Get certified. Go on. I vividly recall my days at Kent State 40 years ago vividly recall taking a, my first speech course. And the professor said, on Monday, three people are going to give their, their first talk. Franklin, Farkas, and uh, Farquhar. Uh, we're going to have these three people speaking. I remember going up to the professor afterward and saying, can I go later in the semester? He said, why, you're not going to be here on Monday? I said, I was going to be there on Monday but I really don't want, to, I don't want to give the talk. He said, why? I said, I'm afraid to get in front of people. He said, what? I said, I'm afraid to get in front of people. I'll never forget his response. He said, Barry, before you're, good, before you're great at something, you gotta be good at it. Before you're good at something, you gotta be bad at it. So you're on for Monday. I gave the talk, I was bad. <laughs> But I'll never forget this same professor said to me, you really, remember the 10,000 hour rule. You really get good at something once you've devoted 10,000 hours to it. You really get good at grants, writing, at speaking, but you gotta put 10,000 hours into it. Let's go back to this, establish, pursue goals. Love the Nike saying, just do it. Who'd like a copy of my new book? One Heart, Two Feet. It's here for the taking. Are you, are you faculty or not? No, no, I'm looking for a student. Who's next? <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Thanks. Your name? Matas, Matasar, your, your name? Devin. Ke Kevin? Devin. Devin. Devin, okay. What did Devin do, thank you, that no other student did? He got off his butt and moved in the direction of something that he wanted. The universe rewards action. Don't tell me I'm going to get this degree. Go and apply for it. Start taking the courses and so on and so forth. It's not just thinking about it. It's taking action. 
Cultivate people skills, praise, integrity, be nice, appreciate people. Failure, rejection are the, the harbingers of success. I'll never forget Michael Jordan, one of the, the icons in basketball. And a quote said, I've missed, I've been entrusted to take the game winning shot and I've missed at least 30, 40 times. I've failed over and over again in terms of this. That's precisely why I succeed. Many people don't know Lincoln lost eight elections before becoming president. Many people don't know that Colonel Saunders tried to get his chicken recipe in over a thousand restaurants before somebody said, we'll try it. Although Colonel Saunders has kept a lot of us in cardiac rehab in business over the years. <laughs> And Jack Canfield, Chicken Soup for the Soul, 140-some publishers before somebody said, well, we'll give this stuff a shot. And he's a multi-zillionaire today. By the way, this guy reads a book every two days, reads a new book every two days. He can talk about anything. Let's talk about people skills. If you ask top executives, What's the thing you're looking for? It's the ability to work with people. When I see young students, I'm not worried if you can read left anterior fascicular block, left bundle branch block, and so on and so forth. I'm wondering, can you interact well with our staff? Can you interact with, well with our patients? It's those people skills that are most important. I worked with an African-American lady who worked with the top people in the world at the American Heart Association, corporate presidents, uh, president of the AHA, the chairman of the board, her name is Shay Kennedy. On every email, she'd always put at the bottom of the email, it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. I'll take it a step further and say if I got two people who have exactly the same credentials, one has good interpersonal skills, the other doesn't, those good interpersonal skills are going to open the door for that person. Praise. If you're supervising people, the best thing you can do is give praise, but do it in public as opposed to private. This series of quotes got my attention. Let me read it to you for those in the back. I think it fair to say that by any conventional measure, a mere seven years after my graduation day, I had failed on an epic scale. An exceptionally short-lived marriage had imploded. I was jobless, a lone parent, and as poor as it is possible to be in modern Britain without being homeless. So why do I talk about the benefits of failure? Simply because failure meant a stripping away of the inessential. I stopped pretending to myself that I was anything other than what I was and began to direct all my energy into finishing the only work that mattered to me. I was set free because my greatest fear had been realized. I had an old typewriter. I had a big idea. And so rock bottom became the solid foundation on which I rebuilt my life. Failure gave me an inner security that I never attained by passing exams or going to school. Failure taught me things about myself that I could have learned no other way. I discovered that I had strong will and more discipline than I had suspected. The knowledge that you've emerged wiser and stronger from setbacks means that you are ever after secure in your ability to survive. Who was that person? J.K. Rawlings. Harry Potter series at Harvard University. I like these quotes. Dale Carnegie, develop success from failures. Discouragement and failure are two of the surest stepping stones to success. Or it's never too late to be what you might have been. At this meeting exactly four years ago, a student came up to me and said, Dr. Franklin, didn't you, you, you wrote the, you were the senior editor for the ACSM guidelines, that black book, and oh, I've read a lot of your papers. How do you do all this stuff? I think he was surprised by my answer. You know what I said? I'm the king of rejection. He said, what? I said, I'm the king of rejection. You don't see all the stuff that we send in that gets declined or major revisions. It comes with the territory. People who are successful dust it off and keep moving in the direction of their dreams. Other principles for success. What else? Be the first to forgive. 
I flew on an airplane years ago next to a, a very attractive, articulate woman. We start, started chatting, and I said, what do you do? She said, I'm the president of a Fortune 500 company. I said, I'm relatively still young in my career. What suggestion would you have? If you could give one thing. She goes, don't hold grudges. If someone's offended you, put it aside, move on, because that person someday will be in a position to help you. And if you're not talking to them, or you're walking around saying bad things about them, they're not going to promote you. Discipline and focus. Anybody who know who this guy is? Olympic gold medalist, Pete Vidmar. People said, what's your secret to success? He said, very simple. Boil it down in a sentence or two. I worked out when I wanted to, and I worked out when I didn't want to. That's called discipline. Strive for constant improvement. Here's something that'll blow your mind. 2002, top 10 golfers in the world, listen carefully. The top golfer, whether you like him or not, in 2002 with Tiger Woods, who averaged 68.56 shots for 18 holes. The number 10 golfer in the world was Sergio Garcia, who averaged 70 shots per 10 hole, for 18 holes. What am I getting at? Tiger Woods was the number one golfer because on average, he beat Sergio Garcia, the number 10 golfer, by 1.5 shots in 18 holes. It's a microcosm of the real world. It pays to be a little bit better. So if you say, I'm thinking about getting a master's, don't think about it, do it. I'm thinking about getting certification, do it. Anything you can do to make yourself a little bit better will, will pay big dividends. By the way, Sir, uh, Tiger Woods in 2002 made $7.9 million, Sergio Garcia $2.2 million, but a company, you may have heard of them, called Nike, in 2002 said we're going to give an $80 million contract to the top golfer in the world, and who was it? Tiger Woods. It pays to be a little bit better. And finally, exceed people's expectations. What am I saying here? Cab driver in New York, People Magazine, makes $40,000 a year more in tips. How's he do it? You walk in his cab, it's clean. The radio is in the back, so you can control the type of music. He's got, he buys copies of the Wall Street Journal, USA Today. There's a coffee maker there. You, you sit in the, in the car, and all of a sudden, if you like a cup of coffee on me or a glass of juice, there's a little juice bar there as well. He spends $4,000 a year. He makes over $40,000 a year because people don't think twice of giving him a $5 or $8 tip when they leave his cab and take a copy of the Wall Street Journal. Exceed people's expectations in everything you do. Transitions great leaders make that average leaders don't. They find positive purpose. They demonstrate rather than talk the game. They put people first, ocean of opportunities, and they become great promoters. Who are you looking at? Two of the most famous midgets in the world a few years ago. John and Greg Rice. They were told there's no job for you guys. We, we can't hire you. We, we need this, we need that, and so on and so forth. Could have turned their lives into a disaster. And they decided they're going to become motivational speakers. The title of their talk was Thinking Big. They were very, very well paid for many, many years going around the country giving that talk. Each individual, by his or her own actions, chooses which story will be theirs, failure or success, regardless of the, the, the uh, cards you're dealt with. Number two, if you want people to do things around you, demonstrate those behaviors yourself. I love this quote, you teach what you know, but you reproduce who you are. Or Oliver Goldsmith said, you can preach a better sermon with your actions than with your lips. Leadership built, built on relationships. You get the most out of people if they know you value them. The best, the best managers, the best directors, go to their staff's parents' funerals. Send a card. 
do things above and beyond to let that person know you care, you truly care about them. I heard a very smart guy once say, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care about them, period. An ocean of opportunities. I love this analogy. Two men walk down to the ocean, one with a teaspoon, the other with a bucket, each taking away the water he chooses to take away. The ocean doesn't care if you come down with a tanker truck. It's miraculously replenishing and unlimited. That represents abundance, and abundance doesn't care either. Your withdrawals don't diminish anybody else's opportunities, nor do their accomplishments diminish yours. It's infinite. The only limits on your share of that water are placed on by you. And finally, become a master promoter. Anytime you can get in front of people. As your visibility increases, your opportunities increase. And by the way, this isn't the ventilatory threshold. It's the visibility threshold. And the more visibility you have, the more opportunities you and your program will have. So take every opportunity to get that visibility. How do you do it? Association involvement, publishing presentations, but ultimately the people who are getting great visibility here have opportunities galore. I want to wrap this up with this true story. High school teacher's sobering final lesson. High school teacher walked into the class the last day and said, I know a lot of you guys are going to college next year. Grades are very, very important. I think you know this stuff in my class, so I'm going to do something a bit unconventional. I'm going to let you make a choice here today. For those who don't want to take the final, I'll give you a B, because I think you would have got a B anyway. Wow. This was a two hour, two and a half hour final. And probably of the 32 students, 28 got up and walked out and said, Whew, boy, that's done. I got a B. There were four students who remained. Then those four students, he said, well, you guys, you want to take the final? And they said, yep, fine. Gave them one sheet of paper. And on that sheet of paper, it said, congratulations. You've just received an A in this class. Keep believing in yourself. In work and in life, go for the gold. Wayne Gretzky said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Go for it. I'm here to tell you, oftentimes, you're going to surprise yourself. What's the take home message you want to leave you with? This. Building a career involves investing time, effort, hard work into things that matter. It's not a matter of circumstance, your career, but of choices you're going to make in the future. Point number one, find something that you love doing. Number two, focus increasingly on your contributions and the money and the trips and the other stuff will come. Make yourself invaluable where you're at. Number three, constantly visualize your goals the opportunity to visit Donald Trump's office one time. I was there for five minutes, but he had pictures of all the buildings that he helped create in New York City there. Find stars as mentors. Association involvement is critical. Serve others. Take action, as the gentleman here did. He got up off his butt and moved in the direction of his goals. Recognize that setbacks line the road to success. Put people first. Partner with others who have skills or abilities you don't have. Treat people good. Go for the gold. See an ocean of opportunities before you and become a promoter. And finally, as Dolly Parton said, if you want the rainbow, you got to put up with the rain. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Barry. That really kicks off the start of this. Uh, we have several different tracks. We're running just a little bit behind. 
I'm not going to go through each track, but we have a lot of other great mentors and speakers in each track. Find the track that you want to go to. Pick the people's minds who are there. They're there to help you. We put this program together so that we can help the early career person. These are all the questions that we wanted to ask when we were in your shoes.